My name is Randy Rubenstein, and welcome to the Mastermind Parenting Podcast. At Mastermind Parenting, we're on a mission to support strong-willed kids and the families that love them. Talking to your kids about the birds and bees can be really uncomfortable, and most people dread the idea of having the talk, but it doesn't have to be this way. Our guest, Amy Lang, has been a sex educator for over 16 years. Oh, you had been a sex educator. For over six yes. When you freaked out about talking to your young son about your favorite topic, surprised by your discomfort with just the idea of talking with him about his body, you knew that you needed help. So Amy did a bunch of research to learn how to talk with kids about bodies and sexuality and realized she could help other parents with this important part of parenting. Amy combined her expertise in adult education and her love of sexual health and started Birds and Bees and Kids in 2006. Her mission is to help parents feel comfortable and confident when they have these important conversations. Through her books, classes, online solutions center, and podcasts, Amy has helped thousands of parents around the world become their kids' go-to birds and bees source. So um, thank you for being here. And I am so excited to pick your brain because this is a topic I get asked about all the time. It is not my area of expertise. I send people your way. So I've been, you know, I, I look always for the best resources and I'm always trying this one out and that one out and watching webinars with people that I'm thinking of recommending. So I've kind of secretly stalked you for a while. Pretty. Um, Thanks. Yeah. And <laughs> Thank so yeah. when your when your people reached out to me, I was like, yes, I love her. Oh, so thank you. I'm, Thank yeah, you. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's dig into it. Now, I know that you have a new book coming out or has it just come out? It's out. It's out. It's called okay. Sex Talks with Tweens, What to Say and How to Say It. And it is the thing that parents always ask me about, which is just tell me what to say. How do I say, you know, how do I explain what masturbation is? Give me the words. So it's mostly scripts on just about everything I could come up with. Now, of course, it's, it's out. And I'm like, oh, should have added that. Should have added that. So I'll have to do an addendum or something. Um, but yeah, so it's out. And there's a little bit of sex talking tips because, of course, I'm not going to I'm not going to skip that. But it's primarily like, how do you talk about all the things? Well, I wish I would have had that. Milo, who is also 21, told me he'd rather talk to strangers than me or his dad about sex. It was not a good moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can imagine, and he has not yet told me everything I've done wrong. I'm kind of dying to know, but I also think I already know. So I maybe I'll ask, maybe I won't ask. I'd like to be in the dark, right? I'd like to be in the dark about that. But yeah, you're not alone. Like most of us didn't don't have any idea how to talk about any of it, let alone masturbation. Like masturbation is like up high on the list in some ways. But you know, and you know, I mean, one of the things for most kids is that the message is that masturbation is shameful and should be hidden and you shouldn't be doing it. And um, unfortunately, it's actually one of the best things a person can do, especially if you have a clitoris. It is pretty damn clean and simple and you can do it almost any place. Not that I recommend, but just getting that message that it's good to be, to feel good in your own body, to understand how your body works and that, um, that it is okay and smart and healthy to masturbate and to learn your body in that, in that way. And it'll make your sex life better, you know, down the, down the road. Mm -hmm. But just to be clear, you do not start your sex talk conversations like this. <laughs> right. No, 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 no. So let's start at the basics. Okay. At what age should parents start talking to their kids about the birds and the bees about sex? Well, it's really um, from the very beginning. And that's those first conversations are using the correct names for private body parts. Kids have a right to know the correct names when we use euphemisms it um, sends a message that there's something shameful or different or embarrassing or something funky up down there uh, because, you know, they, you know, we don't call our noses our smellers, right? Uh, and we shouldn't be calling our vulvas or tacos. And so it just sets up this little bit of like implied discomfort because everybody knows that a taco is something you eat, right? 
I mean, oh God, so I won't go down that path. <laughs> but, <laughs> but sorry. <laughs> You invited me on the show, just saying. Um, so, and the other piece around using correct names for private body parts is that it is protective. So kids who, folks who prey on kids, they want kids to be clueless. And if your child, you know, your kiddo, it's Thanksgiving dinner and everybody's there and you're, you know, your four-year-old says, mama, my penis keeps getting hard in front of God and everyone. Then if there's a creepster at the table, they're going to hear that and know that you're talking with your child. So that's the very first. And then talking about, you know, bodies, boundaries, families, um, those are the sleep, the seed planting that you do to get to the actual reproduction talk, right? So I rec- that's the easiest place to start these conversations because it's science, right? It's a scientific thing. Yes, of course, it's got all this other stuff attached to it. Um, so by the time they are five, they should know the usual way babies are made. Penis is going into vaginas, sperm, egg, pregnancy, birth, all of that. They should know all the ways babies are made because babies aren't always made with penises and vaginas, right? It's always takes a sperm and an egg and however they hook up is different for a lot of different families. And when you get that out of the way, it's easier for you to continue the conversations. For some reason, penis enters vagina. Those three little words are really hard (laughs) for people to get out of their mouths. And, you know, that is because we know about that. Many of us have had penises in our vaginas and vice versa. So we understand that that is sex that's pleasurable, that it's not for reproduction. Really, it's really for fun. Like 99.99% of the time we're doing it because it feels good. So just um, so we project onto our kids and we think, oh my God, you can't know that. But if you can dial it back and think about this is reproduction, this is how we reproduce, this is science, this is how our bodies work. Kids have a human right to know how their bodies work and eventually will work. If we can take that kind of anxiety and weirdness out of it, then it's a lot easier. And they need to know that most of the time people have penis and vagina sex because they want to, because it feels good to their bodies. They're not trying to make a baby. It's a way they connect. It's not for kids. It's for later in life, et cetera, et cetera. You want to plant that seed of pleasure early, right? Because imagine if you had known that, yeah, penis and vagina sex is one way babies are made. And, but the most of the time people are doing it because it feels good. They agree. It's a really great part of life. It's something really wonderful to share your body with somebody. Not everybody does it you know, you don't have to do it. Um, but it's just something that's part of life. If you stepped into that world with that information, if you think about like, okay, who would I be? What kinds of decisions would I have made? Um, so I'll stop talking. No, I, so, okay. So my brain is going, which, okay. So for those of us who had sexual traumas in our past at a young age, um, you know, there was, there was this desire to give my kids this sort of, you know, magical childhood, innocence, all the different things. So now I'm think I'm hearing this and I'm thinking, you know, by the age of five, they're hearing all of this. How do you let them know that, like, what's the appropriate age, that this is not something that little children are going, little children are not going to be having penises entering vaginas, right? Ideally, right. Yeah. Ideally. Right. Um, so the first thing I just want to address is that this idea of innocence, when it comes to this, that's what hurt kid hurts kids mm-hmm. by not talking with them about this stuff, by not saying explicitly, you know, sex is not for kids. It's for later in life. It's not okay for anyone to look at or touch your privates or for some, or for you to look at or touch someone else's mm-hmm. privates. Um, so you need to let me know if that happens, you won't be in trouble and talking about sex as something that, you know, what I say is that it's for later in life. Uh, I don't say an age because average age of first, any kind of sex is about 17. Um, I don't say for marriage because I absolutely do not believe that most people do not wait for marriage. So why set your child up for failure and shame and guilt and all that crap? Um, so what I recommend saying is that, you know, we'll be talking a lot about this. Kids' hearts, minds, and bodies are not ready for this. It's for later in life. Uh, you know, we'll be talking about it a lot. So you have a lot of information. And if you're ever worried or scared or upset, um, if somebody says or done something to you, please tell me you won't be in trouble and we'll get that other person help. 
So do you hear I'm saying we'll kill them? <laughs> Just what you really want to do, right? Mm -hmm. oh, axe murder them. But they usually know, love, and trust that person. It's always mm -hmm. somebody known to the family. It's not a stranger. It is stranger danger is total BS. It is not a thing. Um, 94, 5% of the time, that person that molests a child is someone that's known to them. And pretty much anyone who's been in that experience knows that it was not a stranger. Um, and so this feels uncomfortable, but we come back to that idea of we're projecting, you know, your child is especially at five, they're just a blank slate. They don't know, right. They don't know there's anything fabulous about sex and they don't know there's anything that could be crappy about it. You know, if, if you say, this is what sex is. It's the same to them as saying, this is how you make butter. It's just the same. Mm -hmm. As they get older, right? As they're heading into those tween years, they've gotten a lot of messages about sexuality and relationships and gender and all kinds of things. And so that's starting to impact how they think. But if you're in the door early, you can do the influencing. You can talk with your kiddos about masturbation, right? And in saying, hey, it's important to explore your own body, something you do in private when you're alone, whereas a private place, bathroom, bedroom, right? And you coach them that way, um, then they're going to feel better and do better. Okay. So my brain is going to, okay. So is this, do you wait for questions or do you just like, you know, let me teach you how to turn butter. Oh, and Let's talk about sex. Like, let's talk about what it actually looks like in real life. It's not their job. It is not their job to ask you questions. It's not their job to be seeking out information. It's not their job. You know, we don't, we don't let them make decisions about whether or not they, you know, what they eat, right? We don't say, hey, you know what, honey? Just good luck out there. You don't need to know what's healthy food. Just be, it's fine. You're on your own. Um, Cause that's a, you know, we, we don't do that. We don't let them decide, you know, whether or not they're going to go to school, right? We don't let them make big decisions about their lives. Of course they have influence and we consult them. But when it comes to sex, if you wait for your child to ask you questions, um, you may be waiting a really, really long time. Remember to my child, never ask your daddy a question, right? Um, you may have a kid that's a chatterbox. Um, that's great. It's a lot easier. But um, most people think that the time to start the sex talk, in quotes, is around uh, fifth grade, because that's usually when most schools do some kind of puberty or sex education. And that's just not true. They need to know sooner. They just need to know sooner. It's safer for them. It's easier on you. And you know, the thing I haven't said, I kind of said it, is that you'll be able to talk with your kids about your values. And getting in their heads with your values will set them up to be more successful. Their values will change. Of course, they'll change, but at least you give them a starting point. Mm -hmm. And sometimes parents say to me, I don't want to teach. I want my kid to make their own values. I'm not going to give my kids my values. They can make their own. And it's like, really, really? Like I'm a diehard liberal. I would really, I influence hard on my kiddo because I do not want him to be a MAGA Republican. Right. I mean, so, you know, politics, whatever, but we, yeah, I want him to believe what I believe because I think I'm right. He's going to go make up his own mind eventually. They all do. So pretending or trying to like not talk about your values is impossible because they're going to smell it on you. And if you're explicit about it, especially when it comes to sexuality, uh, it's say it helps them. It helps them make decisions. However, Okay. There's always a caveat. Um, if you are a hardcore wait until marriage, uh, if you're anti anti LGBTQ, if you are if you struggle with any kind of gender changes, if you are very rigid with gender roles, anything like that, that is a problem because kids are it makes you unavailable to your child. So if you don't have sex until marriage person and your kid has a boyfriend or a girlfriend and they end up having sex and pregnancies, potential pregnancy could happen and they are going to be able to ask you what's, you know, for help or whatever, it increases the chances that they're going, things are going to go sideways. So finding a way to do both and, right? Ideally, we'd like you to wait until you get married and we're reality-based. So here's how you protect yourself if you decide to have sex, right? If they're not, it's about their health and safety. It's not counterintuitive, right? It's it's your health and safety comes first. Our values kind of come second. I don't know if like a tangent tangented there, but I'll stop talking again. I could talk forever.
No, it's great because you're passionate about this and this is why you're here because we need, we have things we need to learn, you know, and, and, and I have parents that ask me about this all the time. And I feel like this is such a big topic. You know, my stance is we want to aim to be families that can talk about all the things. And when we don't have the information, then we seek resources and we find the the information from people like you who, thank goodness, are passionate about topics like this that affects every single human out there, Mm -hmm. right? And so, and because so many of us have, you know, unhealed relationships with this topic ourselves, I think it can be so hard to, you know, to, you know, it's just like you get frozen. And, you know, I think one of the things too, that really helped me when I was, uh, you know, I've been doing this work for a while that really helped me um, kind of move into it in a better way is when I started thinking about uh, sexuality education as um, preparation, like preparing them for the world instead of trying to keep them from getting busy, right? Instead of prevention, like don't get, don't get anybody knocked up, be careful. Don't, you know, don't walk down a dark street on your own, right? Like that's, we're trying to prevent stuff from happening. The reality is shit's going to happen, good and bad. And if you think about this in terms of, okay, how am I going to prepare my child for this part of life? What do I want for them? What do I hope for them? How can I help them be as ready as they possibly can? And that for me was a big, good mind shift because I want, Carrie and I wanted Milo, he's living with his girlfriend and, you know, we're all done now, Um, you know, not really, but sort of Um, like, what do we want for him? You know, what was our goal for him or goals for him in terms of his sexuality, sexual health, sense of himself as a sexual person. And that uh, gives you goals, right? Like you got your eye on the prize, right? You want this well, and we wanted this well-informed kiddo who's straight to know all the birth controls so that when he was having his first sexual relationships, he would, you know, our family value was like, you go with your partner and get that, do what you need to do for them to be on, to get on birth control. Uh, we talked about how if somebody did get pregnant. He was absolutely 150% responsible for that child. If the person decided to have the child and just very clear about about that like there's no skating um and so far so good but um you know just you know you know the thing that frustrates me about the universe and child rearing child rearing sounds so old fashioned doesn't it um sounds like dr spock right everyone's like who the hell's dr spock look him up um <laughs> it's not it's not he's not from star trek um this idea, um, like we're so hyper focused on academics and sports and you know, um, like, so like emotional intelligence, which is a part of what I'm getting to, but we're hyper-focused on all this stuff. I know I'm sorry. Trigonometry is not going to serve your child. Like, I don't care if they're in AP classes, if they don't know how, what a healthy relationship looks like, like their AP classes are going to maybe get them into a good college, but they're not going to show them what healthy relationship looks like. They're not going to teach them how to be a healthy sexual person. They're not going to, it's not going to help them in their bodies. It's not going to help them with their gender and sorting out their sexual orientation. It's going to teach them. They're going to have all this knowledge that's going to like, okay, (laughs) like then what? right? Okay. Yay. Go you. But if you can't do this fundamental thing, well, then you kind of screwed. And Mm -hmm. anyway, um, this is my latest soapbox. I have another one, but we don't have to talk about it anyway. So I just want, and so I guess for me, this is part like being a sexual sexuality is part of being human. It is one of the biggest things that we do. It's lifelong. And it is the thing that we have the least information and support about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I completely, I can't tell you how many women I coach that when we really dig into the nitty gritty of what is stressing them out. A lot of times it's relationship issues. They're not parenting on the same page as their partner. They cut, they're the kind of parent that comes and, and takes classes from people like me and people like you and listens to our podcast and is really trying hard to get this right and not Mm -hmm. screw up their kids. Um, And a spoiler alert, as both of us have shared, everyone's going to screw it up. <laughs> not screwing up is not a thing. It's, like, it's not, it's not, right. 
It's no, I always say, yeah. I really, I really think that the goal is to raise kids that are healthy enough that when they get, when they're ready to get the resources they need, they are healthy, worthy people who are like, I want to go to therapy. I want to work through this issue. You did this wrong and you can talk about it. Right. Like if I had like, to me, I'm like, thank you for telling me. And thank goodness we have a great therapist and let me know, let me know how I can help now. Cause I, she's like, I think I got it. I'll talk about it with my therapist. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, out of that conversation. Yeah. I'm like, okay, you know, okay. But I just think that, um, so many moms they'll say like, how do I get my partner to do this parenting thing with me to join me here? And if, when we really dig into it, there's a lack of intimacy in the relationship there when they are having sex, it's to do list sex. Um, they're not, it's not something that, you know, they're necessary. And I'm stereotyping because this is not the case for everyone, but I see this quite often where couples aren't talking about all the things and they're not feeling connected and they're not feeling intimate. And I'm like, I am no sexual dynamo. And I feel like it's when you have a good relationship, like it's supposed to be indulgent and pleasurable and like one of those like, you know, ice cream sundae type pieces of your life. And I don't think that most women are thinking about sex in their relationships like that. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I think you're right. And I think that if we had been told that this is an important part of a relationship, this is how you do it. This is what intimacy looks like. This is um, something that's important. And we all know that, but when you're in the middle of parenting, it is so hard, especially when they're little and they're sucking on you and they are can't, you know, they're hassling you. It's really hard to be, you know, like, all right, and now I'm going to go share my body with somebody else. No. <laughs> right. If you think about it. Okay. How can we establish this, this, um, just these different layers of understanding for yourself, what's attractive to you with your partner, like the things you just talked about, like saying late, like saying, Hey, you know what? It's not always parts and holes folks. You know, sometimes it's this, these quiet moments where you, you know, sweet, whatever, without me asking, or you do this lovely thing or, or whatever. And that makes me feel seen and heard and all that stuff. And then that can lead to deeper intimacy and then ultimately better sex. And, you know, a whole, so much of this is gendered and socialization and all this shit for women in particular that comes with our relationships and then comes with just our physical bodies, right? Like we are vulnerable. We are the ones that primarily get in circumstances and have things done to us that don't happen to men. And, um, and so if we are empowering our kids with this information and making sure our penis havers understand about how vulnerable people can feel and how vulnerable women can be and how they can, you know, stand up and, you know, how to be a bystander if, if, a, if one of their pals is harassing someone and how to say, dude, knock it off or showing porn or all kinds of things and helping them, um, just see women and girls in a different light. Mm. And it's a tall fucking order. I get mm. that. But, you know, this lack of focus on intimacy and relationship and sexuality and all of that is what's kind of leading us into this stuff, like behaving in the same way. And I'm kind of the same, you know, I'm the same way. I've been, Carrie and I have been together, for, married for, I don't know how long, 30 years next year. <gasps> <laughs> when I said I'm 55, I was like, oh God, how'd that happen? Um, and you know, it's a process, right? And and helping kids understand like it, it, it's a circle, it goes up and down, it's not all gonna be wine and roses in a more fundamental way. And then that leads me to saying, you know, your kids need to know about red flags and relationships, right? Imagine, like imagine if you had known early days that if really seriously, like well, these days, if there's someone's texting you all day, all the ding dong day, like that is not healthy and that is not okay. It's controlling and weird and problematic. Um, I have another book called Dating Smarts that basically lists all this stuff out in a more friendly way. Um, and it needs to be updated. So if you get it, I'm sorry, <laughs> there's, it's, it's a little bump. It's, it's about 10 years old. Um, anyway, I mean, I just like what you're saying about that, like drawing this line between our 
childhood experience of sexuality and relationship and then drawing a line to like, where do you want, again, back to where do you want your child to be in their relationship, right? When they're adults, when they've been with the same person for an inordinately long time, like what, what do you hope for them? Like way down the line. Um, and that's hard when you have a four-year-old, right? You just don't want them to do it until they're 30, right? Like full brain development, people, full brain development. And you're not going to get that, but um, it's, it's steps, it's steps towards like those ultimate goals. And then being able when they're young adults to talk about it. Talk well, about tell, it. okay. So, um, so what should parents say? Like when we're starting the conversation off with, and if you guys ha- are like me and you didn't start when your kids were four and five, um, it's never too late, right? It's never yeah. too late. So, so Talk, talk to us about the mistakes we make. Like, how do we talk to them without scaring them? So, you know, <laughs> welcome to life, right? Uh, the first thing is don't assume it's going to scare them or scar them. That's the first thing. And mm-hmm. with those tween years, so most folks are probably like, okay, I got to get this party started. I'm past six. So if you have a kiddo that's nine or so, eight, nine, 10, um, the first thing is to just say, hey, I blew it. We should have been talking about this sooner. I'm getting you some books. I heard this gal on this podcast. Like we need to start talking about this because you need to know. And it can be really confusing and fun and cool and interesting. And your friends are probably talking about it. You know, I really want you to be smart about this. And that's the, that's one conversation, but you need to apologize because when you apologize, I'm sure you talk about this. When you apologize to your kids, they lean into you Mm -hmm. and you're also taking responsibility right? Mm -hmm. I should have done this for you sooner. Mm -hmm. Um, So then you have kicked the door open. Um, There are books in the show notes, lots of resources, and then you just start talking. And, you know, with that eight, nine, 10 year old set, getting the puberty situation cleared up is really important. So um, there's a book called It's So Amazing that talks about sex and everything, families, bodies, boundaries. It's, It's really great. It's sex positive which means that it's the, it's presents sexuality as a positive part of life. That's all sex positive means. It doesn't mean everybody should be swinging from the, you know, rooftops and tied up and masked and ball gagged and all that. That's not what it means. It just means that if you're into that, fine, you enjoy yourself. Um, and so giving them books is great because you don't have to be the expert. Um, they may or may not read them with you. Lots of kids will read them at that age with their parents. And then, really get, getting them books about puberty um, for their own body, uh, just puberty. They really like to read about puberty without having to read about sex. Um, and then the doors open. So you can start talking about it. And you can, there are all these like little dumb tips. Hey, I was just thinking, have you ever heard the word tampon? Do you know what a tampon is? Just out of the blue, right? Or I saw this show. I've been, I've just watched Never Have I Ever, which I think is really great um, to watch with people who are, you know, nine, 10 and up because there's so much that goes on. It's delightful. And there's lots of relationship, friendship stuff, romance stuff, a little bit of, not really, nobody has sex really. Um, It's in the air. Well, people do have sex, but um, like, Hey, you know, remember we watched, we were watching the show and this happened between these two people. You know, I really liked that because, or that I was really uncomfortable. What did you think? Right. And you're going to get a lot of, um, but then they might engage. And so you're just sprinkling it in and don't worry about giving them too much information. It is virtually impossible for most of us to give our kids too much information. I mean, you can give your kids too much information about your own personal sex life. Uh, No one wants to know about their parents' sex life, I'm guessing. Well, except for my daughter, when I had the official talk with her before she went to middle school, um, so I waited way too long and I kept her pretty sheltered and we were watching Glee and it was starting to get kind of racy. Yeah. And I said, so she was 11, almost 12. And I, I said, I said, tell me what you know about sex. And it's a great so question. We, you know, and so we started having a conversation It was impromptu. And the next day we went on a walk and she was, had been thinking about it. And so she started asking me questions. I said, you can ask anything. And so then she said, so do people have sex when, the, you know, is it only to make babies 
or is it, you know, is it other times too? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, it's other times too. And so she goes, wait, so you are having sex with dad? And I was like, yeah, she goes other times too. She goes like every night. And I was like, God, no. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, and so, and, and I was like, wait, you're the one that's supposed to be uncomfortable that, right now. Why am I the one that's, you know, we turned it into kind of a laughing thing where I was like, why are you making me blush? And, um, and it was just like this hysterical conversation that I think both of us, I mean, we've now referenced it many times. Like we look yeah. back on that initial conversation fondly. Um, although obviously I could have talked much more about masturbation. I think I just avoided that oh, whole wow. topic. Screw yeah. that one up. Um, but you know what, but it, it, I think because it was not so super serious and she was asking me questions and it was kind of hilarious, at least that muscle memory was created where it wasn't this taboo subject. Yeah. Most of the time it's can be fun and funny. And so what you described is absolutely not too much information. What's too much information. And I know people experience this is their parents saying, oh my God, just had rock and sex with your dad last night, 14 orgasms. Uh, yeah. Or I'm hooking up with this guy. There's all kinds of, they like, that's too much information. No one want. they don't want to know that they don't need to know that. And then the other thing that since you brought up sexual trauma, um, my belief is that our children do not need to know about our sexual traumas until they are older in their twenties when they can handle, handle that. Um, not everybody agrees with me. Um, somebody once told me she's told her kids all about her sexual abuse because she wants to keep them safe. And in my head, I'm like, Oh, you just want to traumatize them right on. Um, so our kids need to see us as healthy and whole. And it, and so by talking about that, it is a, it's super hard, obviously, and it doesn't serve them now. The time it does serve them is if something happens to them. And then you can say, I am so sorry this happened. It happened to me too. Mm -hmm. You don't know, you need to go into four part glowing harmony detail. They may want to know. So you need to figure out a, you know, with a therapist, ideally how to meet that out to them and talk to them about it. But, um, you know, they need us to see us as whole. And that could be traumatizing to your child. I mean, I'm just thinking about if my mom had told me when I was 12 or 15 or 16 that she'd been, you know, raped or sexually abused, I would look at her differently. I would be afraid for her and sad for her and have all these feelings for her that I don't think a 16 year old should be having for their parent, Mm -hmm. you know, but that's, that is me. That is me. You know, y'all are going to do what y'all are going to do, but I would think really hard about why would, why does your child need to know that about you? Mm-hmm. Is no, there I, a need to know? Mm-hmm. I, they I don't agree with that. Need to know? They don't need yeah. to know. Later on, is your life story sure? They should know. And again, if something happens to them, absolutely, you can tell them in a calm, kind, simple way. Yeah, I agree with that. I um, I so okay. So tell us why. I mean, you already kind of touched upon this, like why you think parents are the best sex educators for your kids. And it's because you, I mean, if you're not the one teaching them, chances are they're learning and they're learning about it from their peers. Is that? And porn, mm-hmm. peers and porn. By the time yeah. kids were, and seniors in high school, peers and porn are the most influential over in terms of their learning about, they're learning about sex and relationships. We're still influential But um, not, you know, when they're under, like, I can't remember, we'll just say 14 or something, we have the most influence. Mm -hmm. Peers and porn are really low. But as they get into high school, peers and porn take, meet us in terms of of our influence. So if we start early with healthy information, accurate information, a lot of information coupled with our values, our kids are in, in, you know, they're puffed up with this information, this knowledge. So when Milo had sex ed here in Washington state, where we now have comprehensive sexuality education, which is yay. Um, it was like fifth grade and they were doing the sex ed thing. And I was dying to ask him how it was going, but I held off for three days. Very proud. We're walking home. And I said, so how's it going? And he said, oh, mama, the questions these kids have like 
oh my God, they're so dumb. And I said, must feel good to already know some of the answers. And he got all puffed up and he said, yeah, it does. And I said, what kinds of questions do they have? And he said, I'm not telling you that. Damn it. (laughs) So (laughs) he felt empowered. He did not like knowing all the things he knew until everyone else knew what he knew. But you want your kid to be the smartest kid on the playground. You want your kid to be the one when somebody says sex is when you kiss with kiss with tongues. You want your kid to say, yeah, not so much. I mean, maybe kind of, but no, that's not what sex is. Maybe they'll fill them in. Maybe they want, well, you could coach them to say, hey, you should ask your parents about that. Kids are going to talk anyway. So you want your child to be in that well, well, like super informed position because it's safer for them. It's safer for them. And frankly, it's safer for their friends. So if you are open and talking about this and their friends know you're open and talking about this, you'll be perceived as a safe adult. And there's a really good chance that a child will confide in you if something's going wrong or sideways or they have questions, which is a real point of privilege and a real place of privilege. So, you know, it is um, you have an opportunity to as a parent to, of course, support your children and help them grow up to be healthy, happy adults. But you also have this place where you can help other kids. You can help other kids. It's a mm-hmm. it's a kind of a cool side effect. Mm-hmm. No, it's true. They're going to talk. And yeah. if you're being really intentional about arming your kids with the right information and then they become the educators, mm-hmm. right? Um, I mean, it it sort of seems like the best case scenario because I know parents always, you know, when we're in fear, we go into that micromanaging, hyper-controlling place. But the truth of the matter is, the reality is they are going to talk. They talk about all kinds of things. We did. Yeah. We did. Oh my gosh. Do you remember, um, do you, because we're similar, we grew up in, in a similar time. So yeah, it's like, the book that we were allowed to read was, are you there? God, it's me, Margaret, Margaret. Right. But right. what was, what was the book that we were all sneaking? Remember, do you remember? Yes. Well, even and wifey. 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 Oh my yeah. gosh. Ooh, hot, hot, hot. I yeah. mean, wifey was like the one that like one person took to camp and they sneaked into their trunk. And then the whole cabin gathered around when the counselors went out to like party and you were home, you were in your cabin and you had one flashlight and you were reading a couple pages. Like wifey was like, oh my gosh. Full of sex. Full, full of sex. sex. Yes. Full of sex. And that's not what happens anymore. Now they go online and share you know, they share porn links and look at porn and all that, which is terrible. And and a very, very unfortunate part of our world and a really unfortunate part of sexuality education because kids think that porn is sex ed. Well, I think they think that's how you do sex. And you you know, what's interesting is that maybe that's the thing that helps parents, um, you know, not make the same mistakes that I made, uh, where they're more proactive from an earlier age, because if we can be in charge of the education and the narrative, and we can let them know from a very young age that porn is destructive and addictive and all the different mess. Like I had, I remember having the conversation cause I had heard, Um, I don't know. I had listened to somebody who was, I can't remember her name right now. You probably know her. She's, she's from England and she's kind of like talks and talks and talks about porn. Yeah. 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 What's her name? What's her name? Um, anyway, so I listened to something from her and I remember having a conversation with my son and he was 12 at the time and I did it on a walk. So we had that whole peripheral vision Mm -hmm. thing going Mm -hmm. And in the middle of it, he was like, how much longer do we have to talk about this? And I'm like, (laughs) we're we're almost done. Um, But I wanted to, I knew he was still at that impressionable age and he hadn't seen porn yet. And so, cause I kind of questioned and and I knew I could tell it was just like, I I could just, it was like my daughter when we watched Glee, like I could tell she actually didn't know what sex was yet. So I could tell that he didn't know yet. And I knew that I could fill his brain with the messages that I wanted to fill, you know, that, um, you know, that, that, that 
that social media can be scary because, um, and I, you know, she just, she, I remember hearing from her that they target these kids and it starts yeah. off, right? Like yeah. they groom them and they want to create a porn addict for life. And, and so I really kind of, I really kind of presented it to him in the way of like, these are the bad guys and this is how they hook you in and, um, and manipulate you. And yeah. so you want to be smarter than that. So, yeah. you know, maybe people will be inclined to be more proactive at an earlier age, just so that you can't can control that narrative. You would be lovely, but people yeah. don't believe me. Like people, you need to use monitoring and filtering on every device your child accesses the internet on. It happens accidentally. Like we're reading wifey. We would have been Googling blowjob, right? Yes. Yes. Right then. Right there. Our kids are the same. They hear the words and song lyrics. They hear the word fuck. They don't want to ask the parent. They Google. And so monitoring and filtering is and educating at an early age about seeing pornography um, is is one of the requirements of parenting. And the average age of exposure is nine that we know of. It's probably younger because people will hand a, a kid an iPad without having any filtering or monitoring in, in because they think their child would never. Oh my goodness, they would never. And they do. And oftentimes even it's accidental. Like they'll Google dolphin and somehow end up in porn, right? It's not, they don't actively seek it out usually. But if a, kid, if a friend at school says, hey, do you know what porn is? You should search porn or Google sex. If you Google sex, here's some homework, listener. Google sex, see what happens and pretend you're 10. Mm-hmm. You're going to see some sex. Mm-hmm. I look once a year and it always makes me gaggy. I'm not down for mm-hmm. it. Um, so, you know, I, this is part of sexual health. We don't want our kids thinking that porn is actually sex ed. And the porn starts in the middle. Um, people's bodies don't look like that. People don't do those. Th- regular people don't do those things, make those sounds. I mean, then the whole industry is just a shit show. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is a product called bark, which we'll link in the show notes and that's really good. Um, and then there's a couple of books, uh, called good pictures, bad pictures that really help explain what to do when they see porn and a little, and about it in general. But, um, you know, this is one of the areas that gets me, as you can hear frustrated because, you know, I don't ask when I teach, I don't ask who's using like I might ask who is, I don't ask who's using monitoring and filtering because it just shames the other parents. Like I'll have mm-hmm. a group, well, before I'd have a group of 25 people and I'd have three people raise their hands that they're using monitoring and filtering. Mm-hmm. Um, so part of Sex Talks with Tweens, there are scripts in there to talk to other parents, to talk to your kids about porn, you know, what to say, you know, if your child's ex- someone, you know, your child's at someone house, else's house and you find out they're porn exposed or your kid shows another kid porn. Um, you know, unfortunately, this is part of sexual sexuality education. We cannot not do it. We cannot not do it. And it sucks. It sucks. It Tell does. You. It does suck. But there's lots of parts of parenting. I mean, come on. We all, and for everybody listening to my podcast, they have a strong-willed kid, a Mm -hmm. strong-willed kid. So yeah, there's lots of sucky parts and we have to be the grownups and we have to lean into the sucky parts. And and so, okay, so let's end it on the pie in the sky, positive note. I want you to tell us about what's going on in Scandinavia. Oh, everything. They do everything right. <laughs> so they have comprehensive sexuality education from which me in their, in their school system, which means that starting in kindergarten, they are learning about bodies and boundaries and families. They, uh, are, you know, they learn about all the things all the way through. So there is in our stupid country, Um, when people hear comprehensive sexuality education, they make up stories like children are being groomed because they're getting this information. That is not true that they're showing kids pornography, not true. Um, and so that's what they're doing there. So kids, there's no, not knowing there basically kids, everybody knows, everybody knows everything. Um, uh, one of the things that's, you know, they have free healthcare, so you don't have to go, Oh God, am I going to go to the Planned Parenthood? Where am I going to go to get birth control? All these clinics that are getting shut down thanks to the situation. That means people are not going to get birth control. 
That means more babies. That means all kinds of trouble. So no agonizing about where am I going to get my sexual health care? Everybody knows it's easy to get. It's free. Um, the So they have the lowest STI, HIV, and pregnancy rates. And But the kind of shitty thing is that when if girls get pregnant, then sometimes they're shamed by their peers who are like, how the hell did that happen? Mm -hmm. And as we all know, it, it just, it can happen. You do all the things and you still get pregnant. Um, they also are really open about nudity and bodies. They don't see bodies as shameful. They're very open in families. They see bodies as a natural, healthy thing. Um, and then they are, they just do better and kids feel better. They have better outcomes. And, and the other thing about those countries, they're very small. So that makes things easier. Like we're massive, but state by state, you can see the states that have really good sexuality education. Um, and they're all on the coasts. Um, those low, low STI pregnancy rates, um, in, in states like Washington, Oregon, and California, and then on the East Coast as well. And, you know, people think, oh my God, I don't want my child to get indoctrinated by having sex ed. Well, um, even if you live in a state that has terrible abstinence-only based sex, sexuality education, it's still okay. I would opt my child I would not opt my child out of that because think of all the rich conversations while they're getting all this terrible misinformation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, unless you have some really strong uh, values-based reason to not let your kid have go through sex ed in their school system, I would just do it. You're going to always have the most power. You're powerful. Your kids are going to listen to you more than they're going to listen to whatever they're getting at school. And if you opt out of it, they're going to talk to their peers. So you might as well have them getting it straight from the teacher instead of interpreted through their, through their peer. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, all the studies show that we have the most power and influence. And so why not use your power for good? Why not mm -hmm. like think about, okay, where do I want my child to be? How do I want them to be ready for this part of life? What's my goal here? You know, who do I want my kiddo to be? Do I want them to be a healthy, happy adult? I'm guessing, yeah. And this mm -hmm. is absolutely a big part of that, right? You, you know that. I mean, I'm mean, preaching to the choir. This is fundamental to being a human being and it's a huge part of life. So get over yourself and get on with it. I mean, well, that and look, if you're raising a boy child, one of, I think, most moms' biggest fears, and maybe dads too, but I think more so with women, is. No one wants to raise the rapist. Absolutely. Right. I, can we all agree on that? Right? right. Like, and if you're raising the girl children, no one wants to raise a girl who ends up getting raped. And right. And so, okay. So that's, so there's the obvious. Well, like you said about sexual abuse, it, you know, stranger danger is bullshit. It's happening with a neighbor or a relative or someone the child knows. And, and most of these rapes are happening. They're date rapes. Mm -hmm. They're happening with, mm -hmm. you know, so, so the boy seemed like a great boy who came from a good family. And next thing you know, he's not controlling his impulses and, um, and, and, and no, doesn't mean no. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, not asking. So he hasn't learned consent culture and she maybe has been raised to, you know, like many of the women from our generation were raised to be a people pleaser or she's been gaslit and mm -hmm. she doesn't even know how to have boundaries. Mm -hmm. So like, I think that for most of us, no matter what your political views are, if you consider yourself, you know, I also consider myself liberal, but if you consider yourself conservative, whatever it is, no one wants to, to, to raise the raper or the rapey. So this is what we have to learn about and know how to talk to our kids about so that they're very much educated on what consent culture is. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that's kind of a conversation for another day, right? You can have, a, we could have a whole conversation about consent and consent culture. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, that kind of the overriding message to your kids should be, you know, sexuality is a wonderful, cool, important part of life. It's important to know all about it. Things can go sideways. They can be really great. 
And like you said, at the end of the day, you know, like you want your child to be empowered, right? Empowered to, um, to make healthy decisions, whatever that looks like on either end, like for themselves or within their partnership. So getting the party started early is the way to go. But if you have delayed, um, my lovely book will help you, um, kind of get that, get that going. And, uh, and, you know, I'm like kind of what we said at the top, I guess I didn't say this. Don't, don't, there's never too late. There's never too late. You just got more to cover in a shorter amount of time. Okay. That's I, yeah. I love that. I love that. Okay. So we will link all the ways for people to get in touch with you, um, order your books. I mean, really, if I could go back in time, I'd be signing up for your programs because this is a very big topic and it's so important. And I think that we can't be scared to learn about it and to, you know, become healthier ourselves, you know, so, so that we can educate our kids. Yeah. And knowledge is empowering. It's not power. It's empowering. Um, and well, if I know you, you have your, we're podcasting, so I have a podcast too. It's called just say this. And it's all like what you just did. It's all Q what well, you t- we talked, but it's all Q and a, so people call in, leave me a voicemail and I answer their questions on the show. Um, so it's really fun and interesting. Cause I don't, um, like I might have a call from a parent of a three-year-old whose kid will not stop touching their clitoris or the, or from a parent of a 15 year old who's seen porn or has a first girlfriend or something like that. So um, it's just a different way to learn. And I think it's really important for people to hear all different ages and stages because you're going to pick something up. Like mm-hmm. even if you have a 15 year old, you're going to pick something up from dealing with the three year old. Well, I think what you pick up, I see this in my groups all the time when people are like, how do you put parents of, you know, little teeny tinies with parents of teenagers? And I said, you know, we all learn from each other. And when you hear like your response to the parent of a three-year-old and you realize you did not handle it that way, when you're talking to your 15-year-old, you can do exactly what you said and apologize and say, I, I kind of blew it. I didn't know what I didn't know. And now I know. And this is what I wish I would have said when you were teeny tiny, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's great. So and- good. Um, Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here. This was such a great conversation. Thank you. It was wonderful. I really had a great time talking with you. Great questions. And you know what, people, you can do this. You can do it. No one's going to die or throw up. I promise. Love it. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks for listening today, guys. I hope you picked up some tips, tools, maybe some baby steps for creating more balance and boundaries in your life. And I just wanted to let you know, if you want to continue moving the needle forward in creating this for yourself, having a happier household, I want you to go to my website and check out mastermindparenting.com. We have three beginning programs. And if you need some accountability and more support, then please look for the one that would be a good fit for you. Um, And as always, we're on all the social channels under Mastermind Parenting. On Instagram, it's Mastermind underscore Parenting. Um, And, you know, periodically I do pop up on different Instagram Lives, Facebook Lives, where I give you teaching and coaching. And I love engaging with you live to help you help your strong-willed kids so that they can feel better. Because when they feel better, they do better. And um, I love, love, love getting to know you guys. So thanks for listening. If you like this podcast, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Super, super appreciative.